When Booster 18 came down damaged, SpaceX did something nobody expected. They sliced it into pieces within 48 hours, but not the way you'd think. The methane tank got cut into three sections, yet the severely damaged oxygen tank stayed whole. Engineers even welded new attachment points onto the destroyed dome. Why preserve the most damaged section while dismantling the rest? What did SpaceX discover in that wreckage that made NASA take notice? And could it change everything about Flight 12? The answer lies in what happened the afternoon of November 21st. A massive crane rolled into Starbase, not the kind you'd use for routine work. This was the heavy-duty equipment reserved for one thing, emergency operations. By sunrise on November 22nd, cutting torches were already firing. But here's where it gets interesting. SpaceX made their first cut right through the middle, separating the liquid oxygen tank from the methane tank. Standard procedure? Not exactly. Most teams would have cut from the top down, removing damaged sections piece by piece. Instead, SpaceX split the booster into two massive halves, like they were looking for something specific. The methane tank came apart fast, three sections by day's end. Engineers focused on the forward dome first, the area closest to the hot staging ring. That's the section that endured the most extreme temperatures during the incident. If you're trying to understand what went wrong, that's your evidence room right there. The middle and aft sections? Those got separated and moved within hours. Then came the part that stopped everyone cold. The liquid oxygen tank. The section that looked worse, the one twisted from impact, stayed intact. No cutting. No sectioning. Just welding. On the morning of November 23rd, Workers were spotted adding reinforcement points to the damaged dome itself. Think about that for a second. You've got a destroyed component, and instead of scrapping it, you're reinforcing it for transport. That means SpaceX wants this piece intact for deep analysis. Whatever data lives inside that crumpled metal, they need it preserved exactly as it is. What could be so valuable in a failed tank that you'd spend hours welding lifting points onto wreckage? The timeline tells us something else. Six days from incident to full dismantlement. For comparison, previous damaged test articles sat at Starbase for weeks before disposal. This wasn't cleanup. This was a forensic operation running against a deadline. And that deadline has a name. Booster 19. While crews were still cutting up B-18, SpaceX dropped their December stacking timeline. Not we're hoping or we're targeting. They said B-19 will be fully stacked in December. That's four weeks from dismantlement to a complete next-generation booster standing on the pad. For context, B-18 took six months to build, and that was with the entire V-3 upgrade package being developed alongside it. So how does SpaceX go from six months to potentially six weeks? Either they started B-19 way earlier than anyone realized, or the V-3 upgrades are now completely standardized and ready for rapid production. Both scenarios point to the same conclusion. They already knew what B-18 was going to teach them before it ever flew. The official statement says Flight 12 is targeting Q1 2026, that's January through March. But if B-19 stacks in December, you're looking at cryogenic testing in early January, static fire by mid-January, and Ship 33 is already complete and waiting at the production site. All it needs is pad access. The math says February, maybe even late January if weather cooperates and testing goes clean. That means SpaceX just turned a catastrophic failure into a six-week development cycle. The question isn't whether they're recovering, they're accelerating. What did they learn from B-18 that's letting them move this fast? While you're thinking about that, look at what's happening to the infrastructure. 
Pad 1's chopsticks are getting surgery. Both arms have been trimmed, landing rails removed, the entire catching mechanism rebuilt from the inside out. These aren't repairs. This is a full conversion to the Block 2 catching system. The new arms are shorter, lighter, more precise. They have to be, because they're not just lifting boosters anymore. They're catching them mid-air at the end of a ballistic descent. The old chopsticks worked for controlled lifts. The new ones need to grab a 250-ton rocket falling at terminal velocity and decelerate it to zero in under two seconds without crushing the vehicle. The tolerances on that are measured in millimeters. One miscalculation and you've got another B-18 situation, or worse. Pad 2 just got its ship quick disconnect arm installed. Not the experimental tube frame design from Pad 1, but a completely redesigned system with an enclosed white corridor that looks like it belongs at Kennedy Space Center, not a Texas beach. The steel frame underneath could probably support a building. Compare that to Pad 1's QD, which shakes every time Starship lifts off past it. This new version isn't going anywhere, but there's a trade-off. The Pad 2 QD appears to be fixed in position, two solid segments instead of the articulated arm on Pad 1. Less flexibility, more stability. That might change once final systems are installed, but right now it looks like SpaceX chose strength over versatility. Probably the right call when you've got 10 million pounds of thrust pushing past your equipment. Both pads are getting upgraded simultaneously while production continues and flights keep launching. Speaking of which, 150 Falcon 9 missions this year. That number hit at 2.53 a.m. Eastern on November 22nd, the same day B-18 was being dismantled. SpaceX launched 29 satellites into orbit, landed the booster, and posted the milestone before most people finished their morning coffee. 150 launches in 11 months. Some rocket programs don't achieve that in a decade. SpaceX did it while simultaneously developing Starship, upgrading two orbital launch pads, and recovering from a major booster incident. The target is 170 by year's end. They need 20 more flights in five weeks. At their current pace, they'll hit it with days to spare. And while all this is happening in Texas and Florida, NASA just stacked Orion on top of the SLS rocket for Artemis II. The first crewed lunar mission since 1972 is now fully assembled inside the Vehicle Assembly Building. Four astronauts, Reed Wiseman, Victor Glover, Christina Koch, and Jeremy Hansen, are going around the moon in 2026, testing systems that will eventually put boots back on the lunar surface. The trajectory is called a hybrid free return. That means if anything goes wrong, gravity brings them home automatically. No engine burns required. It's the safest possible profile for the first crewed deep space mission in over 50 years. The heat shield alone weighs more than most satellites, designed to survive re-entry at 25,000 miles per hour, 7 miles per second, hot enough to melt steel. Ten days in deep space. Life support systems that have never been tested with a crew beyond low Earth orbit. Communication delays, radiation exposure, navigation through cislunar space. Every system gets proven on Artemis II, or the whole program stops until they figure out what went wrong. Here's what connects everything. SpaceX is moving at startup speed while NASA operates at institutional pace, and somehow both approaches are working toward the same goal. Starship is designed to land on the moon as part of Artemis III. That means the booster being built right now in Texas, the one replacing B-18, is part of the same mission architecture that just got stacked in Florida. Different timelines, different methods, same destination. But if SpaceX can turn six months of development into six weeks, and if whatever they learned from B-18 is valuable enough to weld lifting points onto destroyed hardware, what exactly did they find in that wreckage? SpaceX doesn't treat failures as setbacks. 
they treat them as shortcuts. That twisted oxygen tank sitting intact at Starbase is worth more than a hundred test reports. Every damaged section tells them exactly what happens under conditions no simulation can replicate. And now they're betting everything on a February launch. B-19 will carry those lessons. Ship 33 waits with upgraded systems. The new chopsticks will catch with millimeter precision. All of it built on what B-18 taught them in six minutes. NASA sees it too. Artemis II is stacked because when Starship proves it can land on the moon, everything accelerates. 53 years after Apollo 17, two completely different approaches are racing toward the same goal. One moves with institutional precision, the other burns like wildfire. Both will get there. The real question isn't what SpaceX found in that wreckage. It's what happens when Flight 12 ignites the Texas sky. Drop your launch predictions below. January, February, March. Type Flight 12 if you're calling February. Hit like if this changed how you see the B-18 incident. Subscribe to Atlas Space. When B-19 rolls to the pad, you'll want to know what's different. Share this with anyone who thinks SpaceX slowed down. This is Atlas Space. The next launch is closer than you think.